Good morning. Good morning. What a wonderful day to come together and fellowship and worship, to see what God would say to us, to give God honor and praise. What a wonderful day. Um, would you go ahead and put the announcements up? Let's go ahead and get those out of the way. Um, today is the first Sunday of the month. But we're not going to do communion today. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> I forgot. I lost, I completely lost track of what day it was. So, um, so did I. <laughs> potluck, however, thankfully potluck is not dependent on my ability to remember things. It's dependent on your ability. So potluck today, immediately after the service, we'll meet together in the other building. Uh, stay and join us for fellowship. If you are new here and, and haven't brought anything, don't worry. There's always plenty. We get together to eat, enjoy fellowship. Uh, take this opportunity to get to know one another. We also have the nursing home ministry today. This is at the Living Center down at the end of Main Street at 2.30. Uh, 2.30 to 3.30 we go down. Uh, we have someone that leads us in some singing. Somebody will give a devotion. And then we just spend time just talking with the, the people down at the, the Living Center. And just, just fellowship with them. They're starved for people to come down and just interact with them. So we want to reach out to them in, in this manner. Um, Mother's Day breakfast. That's next Sunday, right? Yes. <laughs> See how quick I am? Yeah. Okay. Next Sunday, food preparation begins at 9 o'clock a.m. I'm going to rest here a little bit. Um, we are going to do a little bit different breakfast this year. We're going to do scrambles, which, you know, normally we do scrambled eggs. It's still going to be scrambled eggs, but we're going to have fixings to put in them. Uh, you guys are going to have to help because you're going to have to pick out what kind of fixings you want. Because you probably wouldn't like scrambles the way I do them. So um, we'll just put out a bunch of things on the table. You can pick what you want to go into your scramble, and we'll get a scramble put up for you. We'll probably have some pancakes or biscuits or... I haven't really decided yet. So if you guys have a particular thing that you want, you might want to let me know, because I haven't come grocery shopping yet either. But 9.30, the mothers get to come and enjoy uh, the breakfast that we will serve. We do all the cooking, all the serving, all the cleanup. All you got to do is show up and eat. Okay? So that's our way to reach out and bless the mothers of this church. Um, Dave and Shelly Hunter, Saturday the 17th, which would not be this coming Saturday, would be the following one. Uh, that's their big moving day. Um, we are going to get some people together and go up and help and load stuff up and take them from Idaho to almost Idaho the other way. <laughs> um, so if you have any questions, if you have the time to be able to come out and help move, help carry stuff, load it, take it down, unload, um, talk to Dave. And I went ahead and put your number up there. Is that okay? If not, ignore that number. Oh, I'm sorry, it's in the bulletin. It's in the bulletin. Christy didn't put your number up there. All right, Dave, I just threw you under the bus. So, any other announcements for this week? Anything that didn't get on the list? Um, I don't have a bulletin up here, so I don't know what. Thank you. Oh, let's look to the next one. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Scott and Kathy Edmond have volunteered to allow anybody that needs uh, to get away, spend some time uh, just, just fellowshipping with God, maybe get some time with their family. Uh, they have offered their cabin to whoever would, would like to make use of it. Uh, that's a picture of it right there. It's the one on the top. The one on the top is water. <laughs> so, um, Uh, there are some flyers over there. If you're interested, talk to Scott or Kathy about making arrangements. Uh, Christy and I are going up in uh, about two weeks, is it? Sometime in the next two weeks. Sometime in the next two weeks, so you can't have it those days. <laughs> it's occupied. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to talk to Scott and Kathy. Scott, put your hand up so everybody knows who you are. There you go. Okay. Anything else? Anything I miss? No. Okay, you can go ahead and take that down. Um, 
couple of thank yous that I need to shout out. First, um, last Sunday was an incredible blessing to me. Because on Saturday, we had to call and let people know that I probably wasn't going to be here Sunday. I wasn't going to be available to speak. And the service went off without a hitch. I thought it was well done. Our leadership stepped up. Uh, of course, Steve and Angie always do a wonderful job with worship. Steve's prayer at the end, as always, was divinely inspired. Dennis's message was right on target, timely, direct from God, right to, I don't know about your hearts, but it was right to my heart. Um, and then Matthew's prayer at the end, again, God was just in and out and throughout. So I want to thank our leadership. Uh, God has definitely chosen and called and appointed them. And what a blessing as a pastor to know that if something happens, the church is okay. You know, it's not going to fall apart. And everybody's going to show up and go, well, I guess we watch a video. <laughs> so, what a blessing. Also, I want to say thank you to the DeBoers um, for mowing the lawn and taking care of stuff. And, and uh, you know, mowing the lawn is one of those things that I really enjoy doing. I don't know why. Uh, it gives me time alone. I can think. I can ponder. I can pray. I can sing. Thankfully, the motor's loud enough. You don't have to hear me sing. But it's one of those things that I just, I, I feel a connection with God when I'm sitting on the mower and just vegging. I have had it from a very high authority. I'm not allowed to mow. My wife said no. <laughs> it's a riding mower. You still have to push the pedal. Yeah, brakes are important. <laughs> so, um, thank you for the divorce for stepping up and, and taking care of that. Not only have they come and mowed the church, but they also came over the, to my house and, and mowed my yard as well. So, thank you, divorce family, for doing that. Um, so, I'm going to. Uh, we have a very rare privilege today. Um, we oftentimes pray for people that we don't know. They're outside of our fellowship. And we have people in here that know them, and they bring their prayers to us, and we lift them up before the throne of God. See, that's the, the, the marvelous thing about his body. We don't have to know intimately everybody. We don't have to know every component part. But we pray for each other. When one part hurts, the entire body hurts. When one part rejoices, the entire body rejoices. Well, today, we just to have an opportunity uh, for one of the people, the couples that we've been praying for, off and on for several months, Actually, it's going back quite a while now. Um, so, would you like to come up and share with us what God has been doing for you? Now, I'm sorry, I don't remember your last name. Kaufman. It's in my journal, but my journal's not here. Stay here. Oh, no, I'm going to sit down so I can watch. <laughs> so, I am Ken Kaufman, and this is my wife, Rita. Um... A year ago, December of 12, I found out my wife had a brain tumor. And uh, I'm one of these big guys that's not afraid to show my emotions, so if it embarrasses you, I'm sorry, but God gave me these tears. So. And if you aren't praying for glad, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Yeah, I know. But, uh, you know, God sees it through the unexpected. And uh, the unexpected wasn't having a brain tumor in my brain in my temple. But uh, took it to prayer and had an operation and they removed it. Um, I went in the hospital in April, totally run down with pneumonia. Uh, they took, I think, 11 or 12 bags of IV to get me back where I'm supposed to be. Whatever normal is, I've never figured that out. I heard it's a setting on a dryer, so. <laughs> but, uh, and then found out that, uh, well, she called me, Priya called me and said, do I sound funny? I said, well, you sound tired. No, my speech slurred. She knew that something was wrong. <laughs> well, what had happened is that it, it, the bone and the piece I put in her right then would become infected. So, the first two surgeries were really quick. 
And uh, we didn't have time to get nervous. We didn't have time to really think about it. Um, back up a little bit. In December, though, we knew the surgery was coming, and we had an anointing service from our wife. Use that power. Mm -hmm. James had talks about bringing the elders and born behind a house full of people. And prayer is so powerful. Uh, I went back to work. Um, even back a little bit more. My son from Portland came home. And now here starts another story. We had been living, living together. Married for 10 years, we weren't able to have kids, and we had a guy pray for us. And we both were physically touched, physically touched, and six months later, she was pregnant <laughs> with our firstborn. Sometimes I wonder why God has chosen so much, or chosen us to be so used in so many different ways. I don't really question it, I just want to bow my head and thank and say praise God. Um, I'm a, I believe in miracles. I really, you see me standing here now, I was once 300 pounds. Mm -hmm. I'm now 260. Mm -hmm. Ron said it wasn't big enough that he couldn't see by it this morning when we were saying it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, Ron, you asked me one day why I asked if you were a Christian. Part of me wants to say he just had that aura about him. And I'm not sure I don't embarrass you, but I don't think you were re regularly attending church before I met you. It wasn't me that got him to come back to church that he was gone. Mm -hmm. I'm standing up here today to tell you I thank you for your prayers. Um, I heard there was applause when they went in and looked at me and didn't find anything. And that God deserves all that credit. God deserves all that credit. Um, today, for you and I are not knowing what's next. Uh, I do have a shot that I take once a month. A shot called octreotitis. To, if there's cancer in here somewhere where I don't, I just don't believe there is. I just, I believe it's gone. I don't think they'll ever find it. Um, all the tests I did, I did what a week's worth of tests with with uh, some kind of radioactive dye that set off the alarms at the border <laughs> when I came through. It just, and so they said, well, what, what, what kind of test you had done? I said, I'm like, what are you talking about? I really couldn't, didn't know what they were talking about. They said what had happened, and I realized. But, uh, you know, God sees it all. Um, border people are kind of hard to be patient with. Mm -hmm. But I was able to smile my way through it, and uh, I don't know if I told Ron about this. But the third or fourth, I think it was the third day I went in there, a lady came out. She says, you just park your truck there, I'll be right out. She walks up to me. My uncle was a doctor in the Platte Valley area for a lot of years, Dr. Kaufman. And uh, she says, Doc delivered me, and he delivered, I think, three of my babies. I was in there seven minutes which is almost faster than any time you can do now. I guess you know I'm a truck driver by now. But uh, to this day, I am very thankful for you people as a church. Don't stop praying for us. And told people I don't want to fall flat in my face about you. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you for my wonderful buddy, Ron. Ron, you're amazing. He straightens me out a lot when I get an attitude. <laughs> You guys are lucky, you're not lucky. Christians are lucky, they're blessed. Amen. And uh, you're blessed like a man like Ron, blessed like a pastor. I'm so happy to be here and be able to thank you in person for what you've what you done for us. Praise God. this whole thing out. <laughs> I asked Tim where my cup holder was. <laughs> my remote. 
I don't know how I'm going to be able to do this without moving. I don't, even at home, I don't talk without moving. Your mouth's moving, though. Well, yeah. It, it's lonely. Whenever the phone rings, I pace. I walk from the bedroom to the living room to the back door to the living room to the bedroom. Um, I don't, God's going to have to give us grace today. Yes, he does. He has and he continues to do so. Father, we just bless you today. I thank you, Father, for the testimony of our brother and sister. We thank you, God, for answering prayer. Father, for so many out there that think you don't exist. Father, that you're not involved, that you just don't care. These testimonies give lie to that. We know, Father, that not only do you exist, but you care. You're intimately involved in everything that we do, Father. You long to be intimate with us. And so I thank you, Father. I thank you for this fellowship. We ask your blessing over your word today. I ask, Lord God, that it would encourage us, that it would be edifying, Father, but it would bring glory to your name. We bless you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I have the second part of the Trinity message that I was going to give today, and I'm not going to give it today. We'll, we, we will get back to the essentials when God lets me get back to the essentials. Um, I'm going to share some things with you, and I, I really, I don't even know where I'm going today. I really have no idea. I have some thoughts that I feel like God has placed in my heart, and uh, I just, I, I want to just share some things with you. Um, this past week, actually for about 10 days, 11 days, God has really been dealing with me. He's been taking me through a number of issues, a number of things that he wants to work out in my life, uh, things that I was not really aware of were there. You know, I mean, if you had asked me uh, you know, three or four weeks ago, I would have felt like I was right on target. I was right where God wanted me. Things were going well. Um, boy, did he show me different. Um, he has opened my eyes to quite a few things, um, and I want to share some of those with you today. First thing I want to say to you is that Christ died for our eternity, and we, we generally accept that. We accept that when Christ went to the cross, it was so that we could have an eternal relationship with the Father. The relationship would be restored. And for eternity, we could fellowship with the triune God. Okay? We accept that. But oftentimes, what we fail to see, what we fail to really grasp, what we don't implement and institute in our lives, is he also went to the cross that we might have victory in this life. That we would not be a people that... We come to the cross, we come to salvation, we get to the starting blocks, and then wait. We don't get to the starting blocks and wait for the race to be over. We get to the starting blocks, and we launch, and we run. And we run the race with endurance. We run the race hard. <coughs> Why do we run the race? We run the race that we might win the prize. Okay? God has been showing me. I don't know. I am sharing what God is showing me. I'm not speaking really to you. All I'm doing is, is maybe just testifying to what God is showing me. If this bears witness with your spirit, then I, I pray that you would just take it, that God would show you what he wants you to do. Honestly, I feel like this applies to every Christian everywhere. But this is what God has been showing me. In our walk with Christ, when we run the race, oftentimes, 
we never leave the starting block. We come to the cross and we say, God, I want your salvation. I want forgiveness for my sins. But I don't want the Christian life. I want the reward, but not the cost. I want to go straight from being forgiven to being in heaven. But I don't want anything in between to necessarily change. I know I'm going to have to give up certain things, but we don't ever really consider that he wants us to give up everything. Everything. What do you mean, Pastor, by everything? Well, Jesus tells us that if you love your husband or wife, mother or father, son or daughter, more than me, you're not worthy of me. And that's something that God has had to deal with me about this week. Is I had made my wife and my family an idol. And whereas if someone were to ask me, you know, is your family competing with God? I'd say, no, of course not. God showed me that they really were. They were competing in my heart with the passion, the zeal that I should have for God. Now, here's the amazing thing about this. This is, God doesn't present us with a dilemma without presenting us with an answer. My wife and I have a mathematical disagreement. Division versus multiplication. See, because in my weak thinking, my feeling is if I have to divide my time so that I am putting this much energy in my relationship with God, that means there's that much less that I can give you guys. To my wife and to my children and to my grandchildren, to the work that I feel like God's given me. And she, she says, no, I disagree. You're not dividing your time. God is multiplying your time. And it took me several days to understand this. I'm still, I'm still coming to grips with this. Okay? Because when I give up those things that I feel like are important to me, and I give them to God, and I submit them to Him, He takes that time, He takes those things, and he increases my ability to do them even more. He increases my ability to love Christy more than I could on my own. Because I love him, I can love her more. Because I take time to spend with him, I have more time to spend with her. I don't know how it works. See, that's why he's God and I'm not. Because he's able to do those things. He's able to stretch things. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that when Christ bids a man come, he bids him come and die. Come and die. And what he meant is that when we come to, cross, to the cross, we have to take up the cross. We have to give up our life. We have to give up what we desire, what we want, our passions, our pursuits, our goals, our desires, what we long for. We take all of those things and we offer them to God. And then he goes through them and he says, garbage, garbage. Let's clean this one up and I'll give it back to you later the way it's supposed to be. Garbage, garbage. This one I've given to you. We're going to hold on to that one. Garbage, garbage. And all too often, on the blocks at the start of our race, we're unwilling to get off the blocks because we don't want to give up our garbage. We're afraid of what he's going to take. <coughs> we're afraid of how little he might give back. You don't understand. I've worked at this my entire life. If it's garbage, you've wasted your life. 
been a waste. So then there are the Christians that get off the walks. And they're out for a leisurely stroll through an English garden. Not really bothered with any kind of race. Walk for a little while and smell a flower and maybe sit and relax and enjoy the day. And there's no passion. There's no zeal. There's no heart-wrenching drive to accomplish anything. And we see these Christians all around us. All around us. The people that you worked with for six years, and one day they happen to mention that they were at church on Sunday, and you go, oh, you're a Christian? Well, yeah. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Six years, and I didn't know you were a Christian. Then we have Christians that are sprinters. And I think a lot of times I've been a sprinter. We get real excited about the things of God. Off we go. And then we're pooped. And we have nothing left. Oh God, it's so hard! Where are you? Child, I said, run this race with endurance. The problem that almost every Christian that I've come across, the problem that we all share, is we forget why we're running. Why are we running? Why has he called us to run? What has he, what is his purpose in this? It would make more sense if we came to the cross and he just took us out. Off to heaven we went. But he doesn't. He, he brings us to the cross and then he says, take up your cross every day. Keep yourself there. Why? Paul writes that, uh, flip with me if you would, to Galatians chapter 2. I want to point something out real quick. <clears throat> I like Galatians because I feel like Galatians is kind of the cliff notes for Romans. Paul kind of took the incredible treatise on Christian faith and doctrine in the book of Romans and he squished it down to highlights and sent it to the Galatians. And in this passage in chapter 2, he's talking about we are justified by faith. Okay? We're justified by faith. And I'm going to skip, I'm just going to jump over to verse 20. Because he says something here that is critical to what should be the normal Christian life. Okay? He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. When Ken was up here, he, he mentioned about somehow being able to know that Ron was a Christian. <coughs> Do you know why that is? Have you ever just met someone that you just knew they were a Christian? You just had this connection and you just knew they were a Christian. I believe it's because of this verse. I believe... When you are crucified with Christ, you die. And the one that lives is Christ in you. Now, 
you know, we go through the process of sanctification where we're being made holy. You know, he is forever made perfect those who are being made holy. He's working in us, so we understand that. But if Christ lives in me, and Christ lives in you, it should be much like looking in a mirror. I should be able to see, reflected back on me, those things that he is doing in me. See, the goal should always be less of me, more of him. Less of Glenn, more of Christ. Now, don't get me wrong. Glenn's personality still stays Glenn's personality. He gets rid of the garbage. Because I'm never going to end up being Dennis. Or Caleb. Or Tim. But that's not what he's called me to. He's made each of us unique. But he has called each of us to allow Christ to live in our stead. See, the prize at the end, we want to look at it and go, oh, it's heaven. Well, yeah, that's, that's kind of where we get at the end of our life and we spend eternity with him. But isn't the prize really that we become perfectly holy as he is perfectly holy? See, that's the only way we can come into the throne room of God. That's the whole, the whole purpose of grace. See, when we really start grasping what grace is, we understand what a marvelous, incredible, powerful, wonderful thing His grace is. Because, see, I didn't realize a couple weeks ago that I had divided loyalties. And God, in His grace, showed me another area where I was separating myself from Him. Paul writes in Romans that where sin abounds, where there is much sin, there is more grace. There is more grace. Okay. The idea, I think, is that we are made holy as He is holy. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not expecting that anybody in this life, as a matter of fact, I would question anybody in this life that says they got it. They're there. No, you're not. First John makes it very clear. You're not. Okay? We all struggle. We all stumble. We all fall in many ways. Okay? Again, the marvelous thing about grace. He's, it's covered. We got it. He lifts us back to our feet. Sets us up. Brushes us off. And we go again. The marvelous thing about grace. So, the normal Christian life. What is the normal Christian life supposed to look like? Well, according to what we just read in Galatians, shouldn't it reflect Christ? Shouldn't it? Well, where? <clears throat> I mean, I sing really loud in church. I pray before most every meal I pray. Especially depending on who cooks it. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, not this again. <laughs> I read my Bible. Goodness knows. I just read Galatians 2.20. I read it. Look, all of these things are reflective of a normal Christian life. Those things, if you take them by themselves and try and make a Christian life, you'll end up religious. You're, you're trying to work your way to God instead of allowing God to do with you as He wills. All these things reflect Christ living in you. There's a desire to pray. There's a longing to know the things of God that He's laid out in His Word. There's an understanding that no matter how much I have to give to Him, it's insufficient. But I'm going to give it all anyway. Because He's worthy. There's this idea that no matter how many rotten things are going on in my life, he is worthy of everything that I have to give. That his heart pours out to me.
We celebrated Easter a couple weeks ago. And we remember the cross. We remember the empty tomb. We celebrate. We pat each other on the back. But I really don't think we appreciate the cost. I don't think we really understand. I know I don't understand everything that went on there. I mean, God, knowing what was going to happen, created the earth. Knowing what it was going to cost him, created man. Knowing what it was going to cost him, sent his son to be born of a virgin. Knowing what it was going to cost him, set him to ministry where people were rejoicing and celebrating and patting him on the back and lauding him and saying, let's make this man king. Really? <coughs> the sovereign creator and lord of the universe, you're going to make king. Good for you. And then on that night in the garden, Jesus was on his face. And he's saying, God, please, if there is any other way, if it is possible, let the cup pass from me. That's where we are often, right? God, take this away. Please, just take it away. Remove this from me. But, not my will, but you be done. See, we oftentimes forget that. Who's got the best plan here? Who's got the best plan? I know I, I, I tend to be a perfectionist. I tend to think things should be done a certain way. I like them done logically. I like them done in order. This is why Christy and I do not clean together. <laughs> because I start in a room. I start at the top and I work my way down. The last thing I do is wash the floor and take the trash out. And I get about halfway there, and I find stuff is missing. Because Christy does hers in a different order. And I use order loosely. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the point. The point is the cleaning gets done. Okay? The, the house is clean when she's done, and when I'm done, the house is clean. We just don't work well together cleaning it. So he says, let this cup pass from me. Perfectly understandable. I understand that. God, if it's possible, take this away from me. But here's where we stumble. Not my will, but your will be done. Because he knows. He knows in all of eternity what is best. What is best. We don't get it. We really, we don't understand. A lot of times we look at things and we go, God, how is that best? How is that, how could that possibly be best? When my father passed away last October. I, I have no problem believing that was best. I look at where my dad is now and where he was then. If you don't understand how much better heaven is than earth, especially when earth consists of you weighing 80 pounds and being bedridden and full of bed sores and bones actually punching through your skin. I understand God's plan is best. Now, when my daughter had to go in for heart surgery, I don't see how that was God's best. I don't, I don't understand that. God, why? Why? And they come into the room and say, we need to take her back. God? You raised the dead. This little heart thing should be no problem for you. Why? I don't need to know why. And you don't need to know why. What you need to understand is His grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. In that moment, God's grace was sufficient for me. 
should God have taken Mackenzie home, his grace would have been sufficient for me then too. I still wouldn't have understood. I don't understand why it worked as well as it did. And so many of the doctors said, well, this is kind of a risky procedure. There's a chance, you know, only about 20% of these things actually work the way we want. 20%? Like 1 in 5? 2 in 10? That kind of 20%? And it's, they call it a poster child for that procedure. That's God's grace for me. I mentioned earlier, I kind of started off with the Christian life is for this life. It's part of why I love praise reports. I love seeing God move. I love seeing God act. I love seeing God do miraculous things. Mary Lou shared with us last week. Terry got her report back. No cancer. No cancer. That's an amen. Okay, let's let's try that again. <laughs> Terry got her doctor reports back. No cancer. <laughs> wow. You guys don't know really cool things when you see them. <laughs> what has he promised us in this life? Huh? Yeah. You know, the thing is, Jesus has told us, there's going to be hard things coming on you. If you claim to be one of mine, they hate me, they're going to hate you. As a matter of fact, it goes so far as to say, if you're not experiencing hardships, you might want to check yourself. That's the outside. That's the outside. What about the inside? Well, let's flip over in Galatians a little bit more. over to chapter 5. When we come to salvation, we are sealed with the promise of God's Spirit. Okay? That's what marks us. He stamps us with His Spirit. That's what we were talking about. When you look at a person and you know they're Christian, you, you see the seal, you recognize it. Okay? But if you have God's Spirit, there's a natural outgrowth of that. <laughs> what is that outgrowth? Well, look at chapter 5, verse 22. Okay? Notice what it says. But the fruit of the Spirit, listen, this is not your fruit. Okay? It's not yours. It's being born in your life because you have God's Spirit living in you. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. <coughs> wow. We could do an entire series just on love. What is love? What does it look like? What isn't love? How is it supposed to operate? Joy. I don't really get joy sometimes. I don't understand it. I'm not really what most people would say, I'm not really a joyful person. But I am increasingly more. I am increasingly more joyful. Peace. I think that's something we should all passionately pursue. Peace. Peace. What, what is peace? Is peace meaning, you know, there's just no trouble? No. Peace is in spite of the trouble. Peace. Resting in peace. You know, when life flares up around you and there's things that you don't understand and there's health issues or there's family issues or there's financial issues, there's things that go on. Life has a way of generating issues. But in them all, if we are filled with God's Spirit, 
we should have peace. Now, some have it in greater measure than others. Man, I look at some people that, man, nothing rocks their boat. I feel like my boat's a two-by-four and I got high waves. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God! Patience. Yeah, where my piece is a two-by-four, my patience is a toothpick. <laughs> Kindness. Did you realize that that was a fruit of God's Spirit living inside of you, to be kind? To be kind. To go out of your way to do kind acts for people, to have a, a gentle spirit toward people, to be kind to them. You know, like when that idiot with his big Starbucks and big phone driving his car with his knee, and he cuts across in front of you and makes you spill your little Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> be extended to him. Why? Not for his sake so much as for yours. Goodness. Goodness. Are you good to people? Does your heart intend good to people? Does your body enact that intention? Because all too often we intend good, but we tend to get in the way of good. My mouth betrays me all the time. I start off really intending something good, and then I get in my own way, and I blow it. Goodness. Do you intend good to people? Faithfulness. This is something that I think everybody needs to, all of these we need to be growing in. But think about this. If we are called to be Christ-like, if we are dying and He is growing, if we are becoming less and he is becoming more, shouldn't we then be faithful as he is faithful? Think about how faithful he is to you. When you offend him, and he is faithful and just to forgive you. And then when somebody offends you, Faithful to forgive them. Gentleness. So many of these seem to go against being a man. Men aren't gentle. We're rough. We have hard edges. There's no gentleness. Gentleness is for sissies. Christ was gentle. Christ was gentle. Think about the way he treated people. Think about the children. They're shooting away. Don't, don't bother the master. Don't bother the rabbi. He's a busy man. He's got things to do, important stuff. And Jesus says, hey, 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 hey. What are you doing? Let them come to me. And I love the picture that Mark gives us. Because he doesn't just say that they came to him. He says he picked the child up and held him in his arms. Think about the, the woman that came to plead for her daughter. And she called out to him and said, my daughter's sick. And he said, I've I come to the Jews. It's not right to give what is meant to the, for the children to the dogs. And she said, but even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And he was 
touched and he was moved and he said, your faith has healed her. She's healed. This moment, she is healed. <clears throat> Think about the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus spoke to a woman who was a Samaritan. Okay, now to the Jewish mind, you couldn't get much lower than being a woman unless it was a Samaritan woman. And it says when the disciples came back, they were surprised to find him speaking to her. And he was sharing with her what? The words of life. Living waters. Self-control. Maybe we should skip that one. <laughs> See, this is kind of misrepresented here because really if it's dependent on ourselves to control ourselves, we're all hosed. We're all in trouble. But remember what who, whose fruit is this? Spirit. It's the fruit of his spirit. Okay? So all of these things are natural outgrowths of his spirit living in me. Now there are a lot of these that I look at and I go, God, help me with these because I don't deal well. I don't do these well. But I believe I'm doing them increasingly. Increasingly. Even the ones that I'm particularly weak at. I'm better today than I was a year ago. And so much better than I was 10 years ago that I can't even understand how much God was able to change me. See, when you start the Christian race, we run for the prize. We run with endurance. We run hard. We train so that we can win the prize. We discipline ourselves to do those things that would enable us to win the prize. But God hasn't left it just to our ability to do these things. He has given us His Spirit that gives us the power to accomplish the things that He desires to be accomplished. Why? So that everybody can look at you and go, wow, no. Our lives should be a huge arrow pointing straight back to God. That's all we should be, is a huge arrow pointing straight back to God. I am convinced there are several Christians who, who became very popular back in the previous days that God took home even at fairly early ages because people started looking to them rather than looking to the God that they served. Now, did God take them home as a punishment to them? Absolutely not. Is, when is going to heaven a punishment? Really? Oh, God really got them. God, get me that way. Really? But I think all too often, when we lose the focus and we start looking for the adulation and the praise of man that is rightfully <coughs> belonging to God, we cease to be an instrument of good purpose and we become an instrument of distraction. And we do a disservice to those who would look to us. We become a stumbling block. Our lives should be reflective of God in us. When people look to us, if they see something other than God, we have problems. And if we at any time profess anything other than Christ, we have problems.
it is my heart's desire. that this fellowship would be spurred into those things that God desires of us. That your lives would reflect Him. That you would run the race with endurance, running for the prize, seeking Him every day. Gives you what you need in the moment you need it. He doesn't burden you with things you don't need for tomorrow. Sufficient to today. That's what he gives you. Sufficiency for today. Allow him to kill you. Allow him to replace you with himself. Allow him to make those changes that would glorify himself in you. So that your entire life would be nothing more than a giant sign pointing to him. Pointing to his glory, to his goodness, to his faithfulness, to his love, to his heart. Get off the starting blocks. Quit lollygagging through the park. Quit being distracted by all the crap that this life throws at us. Set aside what you believe are your goals, your values, the things that you think are important. Submit those to Him. You'll be amazed when He gives you that. You might be amazed when He takes away too. Tell you what, man, it will be so much more beautiful because of it. Your life will be so much more beautiful because of it. Trust me. Father, Help us to be those things that you have called us to be. Father God, to seek you earnestly. Father, as though a great prize. <clears throat> Lord God, that there is nothing else <clears throat> of value compared to you. Lord God, help us to be aware of those things that are causing us to stumble, those fetters that bind us that lock us in place, that limit us. Help us, Father, to be shed of those. Help us, God, to set our minds right before you, to set our priorities straight before you. Help us, Father, to long to be in your presence, to desire everything that you have for us, no matter what it looks like to be willing to lay down whatsoever you would ask of us, and to be willing to pick up whatsoever you would ask. Strengthen us, Father, for this run. <clears throat> Help us, Father, to come alongside those who are stumbling, those who may be weak, Father, those who may need encouragement, may need an arm to support them for a time. Help us, Father, that we would understand that we all run this race together. And through this, Father, we bring glory to you. We bless you today, Father, and we thank you in Jesus' name.